Today, I was the sucker. But because I was the sucker willingly, I was not. They didn't die, at least not when expected. The man with the hatchet who thought himself wrath was impotent in the end. The old man Harold who'd lost the most blood still had enough to see himself through for 14 months and more. With no recollections of rending and rage, his brain had spared him that. I wasn't so lucky. The Reaper's shortcomings are etched in gray matter for me. So if you've a mind, I'll tell you the tale. Just leave if I run too long. I've processed this counting on fingers for nearly 40 years. It was spring after bicentennial. How could I ever forget? Lakes of blood coagulating a battlefield in the stillness. Impolitic to talk of such things, and so I've held my peace. Nobody wanted to hear this tale, too truthful by half for most people's ears, a crime never solved. Since 1977, this slaughter has lingered. Cold case is the term oft used. It isn't cold for me. It's warm in my gut with the taste of the memories of Harold and Bruce and Michelle. She's the last one living still, though her ungainly walk lingers too. Imagine the nightmare she's lived with. She heard the thwacks of the hatchet as they fell on Harold and Bruce. She'd seen each of them dragged further back in the store, first Harold in the sound of a punching bag, then moments later, Bruce. Bruce, whose superhuman strength kept him conscious through it all, even after they'd hammered Michelle and tracked blood out of the store. Bruce broke the ties that bound him, stood up from the gore that had puddled of his own exsanguination ran out of the shop seeking help. By rights, he shouldn't have been able to walk. Ran to the party store, crossed the street. They saw him coming and locked their door against his gory visage. Happenstance placed an off-duty cop in his own car driving by. The cop called the bus and soon two more when Bruce led him back to the store. Bubbles of light of red, white, and blue converged at the corner of Monica. Triage decided that Harold was dead. First we'll prep Bruce and Michelle. Harold can go in the coroner's van. Wait, I'm getting a pulse. Plasma, set. I was not witness to any of this, but I'll tell you how I know. On my way to the store, I'd stopped off at school, Mary Grove, six blocks away. I'd taken off to go touring, beginning my next career. The tour being done, it was back to O'Halloran's. I'd worked there since I was 12. And now was the buildup to Easter. Extra help was called for, so I was on my way to find out what help perhaps I could be. I just pulled off to chat with some classmates. Got out of my car and Ron Merkin asked me about all the fuss. He'd just been by the flower shop, saw cops, EMS, the works. I got back in my bug and I shot to the store wondering what could be wrong. The cop at the door said I couldn't come in, too awful for my eyes to see. I told him it would fall to me to clean up, whatever it happened to be. He relented. Okay, stay with me. We walked through the showroom, seeming nothing amiss. By the workbenches, things went south. There he showed me the first of the blood. Michelle's, I would find out later. 
forensics was working the register. My guide looked to see if I'd stomach for more because I seemed stoic. We stepped to the back of the store. Just by the bench where we boxed things for transport in front of the walk-in back box, uh, this was the place where Bruce had been hacked. How could he have stood up from this? The blood was mounded near two inches thick. Then we walked back to the lunchroom. Here was the worst of the worst. Harold's blood, he showed me. How could he still be alive? Discolored to purple at the heart of the pool and mounded again against the moldings and splattered paintings by Pollock. For weeks, I would find places still hidden, more of their spewing to clean. But now it was off to Mount Carmel. Police could lock up the place. I had to see if they'd made it. I was allowed in with the families. Bruce's wife, Stella, the first that I saw, said Bruce was just out of surgery. Hundreds of stitches. We could talk to him soon. Harold and Michelle would be longer. When they brought Bruce into his room, he was talking, lickety-split. Stella hugged him as much as she could, careful to avoid the damage. She stayed to his right. That part seemed okay. To his left, he was all one bandage, even onto his face. One errant swipe had oped his left cheek, even caught a bit of his tongue. But it didn't hinder him talking, regardless of sedation. He rattled as if singing patter. Gilbert and Sullivan came to mind. Then a detective came into the room. That stopped him. Just long enough to hear what the cop wanted to hear. The cop had something stashed under his coat. He'd been careful to cup it coming in. He produced a shiny new hatchet. Bruce didn't even flinch. Did it look like this? Bruce said yes, but the one used on him wasn't new. Rusty and bloody and hanging with hair was the way he described it. The film in my head of the crime scene started playing in slow motion. A nurse stepped up with some popper vial, said I was looking green. I, I snapped one and whipped in the vapors. I couldn't faint now. Bruce was just getting started. Stella would need my support. We had to let Bruce tell it all to the cop. Then I would know how it happened. Bruce was a god. He had suffered so much, but for him all three would be dead. I could stay strong, at least through the telling, and next day I'd clean up the mess get the shop ready for Easter and sell off the stock that would otherwise rot and cost them even more than what they'd already lost. I digress. Here's how Bruce told the story. They were working a regular weekday morn, Harold and Bruce and Michelle. Two walked in. One held a gun and told them to kneel on the floor. The other tied their hands behind, then dragged Harold way back in the store. Bruce said he thought he was punching his dad. That was the sound he heard. Smack, 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 smack. Bruce punched his own palm to mimic each word. Then he said there was silence. An awkward moment of pause till he saw the redhead emerge from the back with hair and blood on the blade. And Bruce said the man's face was expressionless, inscrutable like the Chinese, as if he'd just delivered the goods and now he was on to the next. He then dragged Bruce not quite so far back, just out of sight round the wall, and chopped at the back of his head and neck. Then came back for Michelle. For no reason discernible, he went lighter on her. She thought her prayers were the cause. 
In her own accounting, she found God in all this, thanked him for sparing her life. She didn't thank God for the one whack she got. I found in that thanks she was lacking. Twas God who delivered the lot of the whacks, twelve of them and counting. I'm tired of hearing these charges to the devil. Twas God and nobody else. Only God could unleash such unreasonable wrath. No man could muster the strength to take out this cadre of people I loved. My sole source of suckle. Harold and Bruce had taken me in. My own mom and dad just begat me. Threw me into a bed with some others. They hadn't wanted them either. Eight of us passed the five they had prayed for. At 12, I found life in the flower shop. For 50 cents an hour, I worked one or two hours a day. Doesn't sound like much, but to me it was something more than I'd ever had. After high school, I went full-time and landscaped their houses for extra. Detailed their cars, drove the Lincoln to prom. They were generous to a fault. When my brother had died, they did mix flowers at no cost whatsoever. Now you see how important they were. Now you know why I was stoic and stunned as the cop had shown me the blood, the gore I'd cleaned to reopen the store, all those Easter lilies to sell, every customer wanting to hear the whole story, and I wanted to tell, but there wasn't the time. Perishable goods don't wait. I kept the store going a fortnight. Then I closed it for good. Even well, they wouldn't come back. Customers have to go elsewhere. Detroit and God had done their worst to the flower shop on the corner. So thanks for letting me bend your ear. I've needed to do this for years. A modern day horror in Albany is what brought it back to the fore Shocked by my fellow's unkindness, I had a need to remember what I'd survived 40 years ago. The current dust-up pales by comparison. I can walk on from this with glee. I have another new family at Amacusina. They keep the door open for me. <laughs>